Well, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure being here again with you uh, today. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, secondary intraocular lenses in aphakia. Uh, these are my uh, financial relationships, none of them related to this uh, talk. So when we look at the causes of uh, the secondary IOLs, uh, this uh, a review I did of my patients between 2003 and 2011, which were 57 cases. Uh, the most common cause was, as you can see, ocular trauma, followed by congenital cataract, um, complicated uh, cataract surgery or, or complicated pseudophagia, then uh, subluxated lenses, uh, either through Marfan syndrome uh, or wild marchesani, um, uh, intracapsular extraction, vitrectomy, and subluxated IOLs. Uh, reviewing the, the causes uh, between 2011 and 2023, um, I found that the most common cause, again, was uh, ocular trauma, followed by uh, vitrectomy and um, complicated cataract surgery. So generally, these are the, the most common causes in, in which a primary IOL is not being uh, able to implant. And then we have the need to, in a second procedure, uh, fixate an intraocular lens. What, what, you know, what moves us or what forces us to uh, implant a secondary IOL? The first is uh, aesthetic reasons. Uh, as you know, patients that have uh, iphakia will need high powered plus lenses. And this obviously has an impact. These are very thick lenses that magnify images and that magnification leads to uh, a lot of um, um, yeah, difficulties in day-to-day -day life, like walking or like uh, estimated distances. Uh, and uh, so that forces us uh, to, uh, you know, analyze uh, our patients and see if they need a secondary IOL. The other reason is we always try to fit these patients that have aphakia with uh, contact lenses. But, you know, uh, fitting contact lenses in elder, elderly people, especially, it's uh, a little bit uh, cumbersome. Um, many of, of, of them have difficulty putting them in or removing the lenses. And, um, and also that leads, uh, if they have dry eye, uh, they might become intolerant to contact lenses. And that also forces us to correct their aphakia. Anisometropia is another cause. Again, if it's uh, only one eye that was not able to get an implant, then patients will, won't be able to, to, to tolerate a plus, a highly plus lens in one eye and a, and a lower prescription on the other eye. Cases like this one, and we need to do an anterior segment reconstruction. Again, if we're thinking of doing an endothelial keratoplasty, well, we need to really uh, solve the issues with the anterior segment before, um, uh, doing it so the, the graph will stay in place, and that is another cause. So what do we do with patients that need uh, secondary uh, IOL? First, we have to evaluate the corneal transparency. We need to make sure that the endothelial cell count is good enough to sustain a uh, secondary procedure uh, that will be long and that will need a lot of manipulation inside of the eye. So we, we need to make sure that uh, the uh, endothelial cell count is good enough for us to do that. Uh, yesterday, I saw a patient in my practice that she had a, uh, a corneal transplant. She had a cataract surgery, but she was left with a minus five, minus four uh, outcome. And um, she wanted, I, I actually uh, did a transplant in her, in her right eye, a, uh, a deep anterior laminar keratoplasty. Then I did a cataract with a, with a toric IOL, and her vision is actually quite good out of that eye, so she wants me to fix her other eye. But uh, doing an endothelial cell count, she has only 500 cells per square millimeter, although the cornea is nice and clear. Again, we discussed the options of doing um, a piggyback IOL uh, uh, to correct her astigmatism and her nearsightedness. And again, with 500 cells, you really think it twice because then you would 
um, in the future be forced uh, to do an endothelial uh, keratoplasty. In case that we have low cell counts, and we'll see it during the webinar, um, sometimes what I'll just tell the patients, let's do, let's do a combined procedure, let's do uh, a DSEC and uh, fixate uh, a secondary IL. The other thing that we need to evaluate in the pre-op is the anatomical, anatomical integrity of the anterior segment. So these cases are tough. When we go in, we want to make sure that we know uh, what we're um, looking into. Uh, uh, we, we, we really need to know if there's beaches in the anterior chamber. We need to know how the pupil stands, if it's uh, regular or irregular, if there's sneakyae, if there are capsular remnants, we wanna make sure that if there are, we can, we can use it to place the IOL. We need to see if there's features in the anterior chamber. And we also need to uh, make sure that the retina is uh, healthy enough uh, for a good visual prognosis. And all of these things we do, obviously, by our slit lamp examination, by doing endo an endothelial cell count, by doing an echography, if we're not able to see adequately uh, the retina and uh, make sure that uh, everything is fine before we even um, uh, suggest to our patients that we'll do a secondary IOL implantation. So what types of, uh, of uh, IOLs can we implant? So we have um, uh, intraocular lenses that will go in the anterior chamber. Uh, here we have uh, angle uh, supported uh, IOLs or, or iris fixated IOLs. Within the angle supported, we have the Bikoff uh, lens, uh, which we'll see um, in the future. I don't like it all that much. And, and we'll see why we have the artisan um, iris claw lens uh, uh, that is actually fixated in the iris and uh, it is a very good option for secondary uh, IOL. Then we have the posterior chamber IOLs in which we'll basically implant three piece IOLs, either an MA60, uh, Technics 1, a, a focus matrix or an inverted artisan, a fake lens is a good option. Um, and uh, we could also use single piece IOLs uh, there are a few uh, surgical procedures and we can use uh, single piece IOLs like the flank um, um, a technique or the kind of Brava uh, technique. Uh, in terms of the three piece IOLs, either we'll just suture them um, either to the iris or, or to the sclera, or we can fixate them either to the sclera or uh, gluing in them or just fixating them uh, like the Yamani technique. So first, uh, what happens when we have, we examine our patient and we see that there's a capsular remnant. Like in this case, there's a patient that had an ocular trauma. He, he, her, his cornea uh, was uh, sutured and uh, the cataract or the lens was aspirated. And then he comes for a secondary IOL. As we can see, we have a very uh, nice anterior segment with a clear uh, uh, central cornea and we have a good capsular remnant, and we have posterior sinicae. So the, in this patient, obviously the best, age, uh, the best option will be to implant the secondary IOL in the capsule, in the, uh, in the remnant, uh, capsule remnant that we have. But first we need to make sure that we're able to remove these posterior sinicae. And here I'm gonna pause it for a second. Um, it's always important as you saw that we go and not only liberate the the, the pupil, the, the sinicia that are formed uh, on the uh, on the pupil, but it's important that we also go behind the iris because the sinicia not only forms on the pupil but also forms um, in the mid iris. And if we don't liberate all that sinicia, then uh, when we implant the lens, it will not sit right. It will it will be difficult to to position it. And that's why, as you can see, I go with this uh, uh, the viscoelastic and a cyclodialysis spatula to liber uh, liberating uh, those sinicae. Then we use a three-piece IOL. This is a very good option. This is the MA60 lens uh, that has an acrylic uh, optic and it has uh, uh, PMMA uh, or uh, haptics or nylon haptics that we can place very well. As you can see over here, there's a, a, a slight sinicia. So again, we try, I try to reposition the haptic uh, so the lens sits very well in the sulcus, uh, again, with very good centration. Um, and then we can uh, go ahead 
and um, suture the iris, like in this case, to reconstruct uh, the pupil. Um, again, very uh, simple technique using a uh, tenno proline suture and uh, using a, a sipser knot uh, with the modified <clears throat> Argawal technique in which instead of doing um, you know, three passes to our knot, we do four passes and that'll fixate our, our, our knot uh, perfectly uh, with a very good uh, apposition of the uh, iris. And again, with one knot, that is enough. We don't need to um, do any other more suturing in the, um, in the pupil, um, getting a, a very nice and a clean reconstruction. As, as you can see, just one knot is enough. Uh, again, by doing four passes, it'll stay in place. And this is the test that it stays in, uh, stays in place, both the IOL and the iris suture with a very nice reconstruction. So when we ever have a good 360 degree or even 200 or 380 degree remnant of the capsular bag, uh, then it is a good option to just fixate it in uh, the in, in, on top of the capsule and reconstruct the anterior segment. The other option uh, for um, uh, when we have a fakia is an anterior chamber angle supported IOL. This is a one piece PMMA lens. It has a five millimeter optic. It's fixated on the angle. It has four points of contact. Um, uh, and, you know, the advantage is that it's very easy to implant. Um, disadvantages is that because it's, it's uh, positioned on the angle, it could uh, produce a uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome, uh, again, with um, in, increasing the intraocular pressure, uh, cells in the interchamber, chamber, and even bleeding. The problem with these lenses is that it's a one size fits all. And as you know, anterior chambers are not um, all the same. If it's, a, again, a, a larger white to white distance, the lens will tend to move and that could affect the endothelium. And then if it's a short white to white uh, distance, then the compression or the pressure against the angle will produce, again, glaucoma. So these lenses I don't like, but, and this might be a bias uh, that the patients that I see generally come like this patient with a decompensated uh, cornea. So I would think that uh, the only option in which would be a good idea to implant these lenses is in elderly patients in which life expectancy is limited and um, <clears throat> again, will ensure that we could place a lens and the patient will uh, not live long enough to have a corneal decompensation. Because I don't implant these lenses, I don't have a video implanting it, but I do um, have uh, the explantation of one of these lenses. Again, if you know how to explant, explant them, you know how to implant them. It's really not uh, all that difficult. In this case, I'm going to explant a bike of IOL uh, that is moving, as you can see, is, is subluxed. And uh, I have, I, I'm gonna remove it and replace it with an artisan a fake lens. Because these lenses are five millimeters in um, diameter, then we should open the, uh, our wound, uh, we could do it corneal or we could do it uh, limbal, but we should open it to 5.5. In this case, because I'm implanting and implanting in a uh, artisan a fake lens, uh, again, I'll open it to 6.5 millimeters. Um, as you can see, this lens, again, the haptic is PMMA, so you can, you can remove it. It was behind the uh, iridectomy, uh, so uh, basically, uh, you just can move it. Sometimes these haptics, if the uh, uh, anterior chamber is small and the white-to-white -white distance is small, uh, these lenses might uh, get entangled in the iris. And if that happens, a good option to remove them is just uh, cut the haptics um, with some scissors, and then you can just proceed and explant the lens. Uh, then uh, this lens is replaced by an artisan aphakia lens. And um, uh, we'll talk about these uh, lenses uh, in the next uh, slide. Um, 
Uh, so artis uh, artisan efake lenses are very good options. Um, again, they've been around for a very, very long time. To give you an idea, the first of these uh, lenses, uh, they were called worst lenses because they were invented by, by Worst uh, in, in uh, Holland uh, in the 1970s. Um, the first lens of uh, 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 the first of these lenses was implanted in 1980. Uh, they're called iris claw lenses because basically their haptics have a little opening that acts like a like a like a lobster claw in which we entangle the mid iris. And because they're sitting in the mid iris and not not in the angle, again they have lower complications. They don't have uveitis glaucoma, hyphema syndrome. Uh, uh, they could still lead to, to corneal decompensation. And we'll see that in, in, in a few slides, in a few slides. Uh, but again, they're very easy to implant. We've been implanting them at the Barracker since 1998 uh, with a very good uh, experience in uh, as phakic IOLs and as a fakia lenses, uh, very easy to implant. And um, uh, again, we need to make sure that the iris is uh, well enough to hold the lens, so it, it has to be, there has to be iris integrity. And as I said, again, because they're in the anterior chamber, they could lead to um, corneal uh, decompensation and uh, and the need for endothelial keratoplasty. This can be compensated by doing a retropupillary implantation, but it's not, it's not difficult to perform, basically, because the lens has evolved. You invert the lens and you fixate it uh, underneath the iris um, with a uh, spatula, and it holds uh, very, very well. So this is the implantation. As I said, it is a very simple procedure. Uh, this was my preferred uh, lens, um, probably between the 2000 and and uh, 2012, uh, when I um, shifted to iris fixated uh, IOLs. Again, we do we can do a corneal incision or we could do a uh, scleral tunnel. Uh, the size of the lens, as I said, was a six millimeter optic. optic so the our, our incision needs to be uh, 0 0.5 millimeter larger. The advantage of doing a, and a, a scleral uh, incision is that we can manage astigmatism in a much uh, better uh, way. Uh, we make two paracentesis uh, in which we'll uh, use to uh, do the enclavation of the iris. The lens goes in you know, fairly easy with cohesive uh, viscoelastic. Then uh, it's important that we uh, close the wound with uh, two sutures, leave a central opening for the manipulation and the fixation of the, hop, the, of the optic when we do the fixation. Uh, it is important that, that once we center the lens, we shift it slightly downward, as you can see, and then we go in with, the, with these uh, fixation needles and we just go under the iris and fixate the lens uh, to the um, uh, iris claw to the haptic. It's very important that we take a good chunk of, uh, of uh, iris uh, around a millimeter um, so that that will allow the lens to sit very well and uh, be very, uh, again, be very stable. Very simple procedure to do. Once we aspirate to the scholastic, we just hydrate uh, our, our uh, uh, incisions and the case is finished. Again, very good option. You could you could do this inverted, uh, the vault inverted and under the iris. It is also important because these they are uh, um, positive lenses that we do a uh, an iridectomy. In this case, I didn't do an iridectomy, um, but I had uh, initially. I wouldn't do them because of the vault of the lens, but uh, then I had a pupillary. A blockade and I needed to do it uh, um, as an emergency. And after that, I always do a, 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 a peripheral iridectomy. These lenses are thick, so the odds of, of the, uh, the optic uh, you know, blockading the pupil are higher. Uh, this is uh, another case uh, of, this, of the same type of a fake lens in a Marfan syndrome. This is a subluxated um, 
uh, crystalline lens. So you can not, you don't only have to do it as a, as a secondary procedure, but you could also do it as a primary procedure, like in this case, in which we'll, I'll remove the, uh, the subluxated lens. Uh, this is a young, uh, it was, she was like 16 years old uh, with a Marfan syndrome. Uh, again, removing the cataract or the crystalline lens is a little bit difficult, uh, although these are high, uh, easy to aspirate. Um, uh, again, they have no or very little sonular support, and that's what uh, really makes it uh, difficult. Uh, here, what I'm doing is I do a small capsular rexis, then I, I, I center the lens with a uh, uh, iris uh, hooks, uh, again, because the capsule in these young patients is highly elastic. There's basically little risk of, of, of rupturing the capsule. The lens is then aspirated with a FACO. Again, because they're soft lenses, you don't need to use the FACO tip. You could just use uh, a bimanual technique with uh, the Barato cannula or with a 20, 25 gauge aspiration cannula. And um, as you can see, very simple to aspirate. I'm gonna advance this a little bit. Very simple to aspirate. Very simple to aspirate here. I'm advancing a little bit. Again, it just takes time. It's important to put some viscoelastic because the capsule, uh, the posterior capsule tends to come forward and include the tip. It's, it's just a patient. And I also like to do it within the bag. We don't wanna do it um, again in the interchamber as some of these um, um, uh, lenticular remnants can go to the vitreous cavity. Then once it is aspirated, I like to leave the bag uh, and not remove it. Again, we don't want vitreous coming out. These patients with Marfan syndrome have very large eyes. There's a high risk of retinal detachment. So the the, the less we 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 you know interfere with the vitreous, uh, the the better. Um, uh, then we do our our paracentesis and we fixate. The lens, uh, important to, to put some uh, myocol to constrict the pupil, pupil that will uh, make it easier to uh, center the lens. And as you can see, we fixate it, we, de we do a peripheral iridectomy and close the wound and the case is uh, finished. This is the post-op, as you can see, the capsule retracts. We have a good uh, fixation of the lens with a millimeter of iris enclaved in the optic, and again, the capsule basically retracts. If it doesn't, we can do an early um, capsulotomy um, again, but that is a better option than having to do a vitrectomy um, in these cases. Then uh, uh, other, uh, a little bit more complicated cases. This is a highly uh, subluxed, very dense cataract. This is a patient that had a posterior vitrectomy for retinal detachment. Uh, the retinologist told him, you're gonna develop a cataract. When you develop a cataract, go see a Dr. Otero that he'll remove his cataract. And he, he, he came from Panama and he comes with this, you know, dangling cataract um, uh, uh, with a vitrectomized eye. So I decided to do a, a cryo extraction of the cataract, uh, again, um, it is a very dense, so trying to bring the lens uh, forward and fixating the cataract, the cataract is uh, is uh, a little bit difficult. And uh, so he, here I go. I just uh, open the eye uh, for those very young uh, surgeons that haven't seen this. Again, you know, you take your cryo probe and uh, you just hold on the capsule and very gently do a sideways movement until the, the crystalline um, uh, comes out. Again, very good option. Uh, it's important that we that we use that fixating suture so the, the cornea doesn't um, uh, come in contact with a cryoprobe. And then I'll go in and fixate a uh, an artisan, a fake lens. Um, Again, great option for this patient, uh, very uh, easy to do. This is a fixation uh, 
uh, forceps that, that basically comes with these lenses. As you can see, it has these uh, 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 tip that uh, stabilizes the, um, the lens or the optic. So we could do the enclavation of the lens. Uh, we can do it in, in complex cases like this one that had the, some cops to the remnant. The iris wasn't all that good, but if the lens sits well and the cornea is good enough, then we can do the enclavation. Uh, so that is the um, anterior chamber IOLs. Then uh, we'll move to the posterior chamber IOLs and the different techniques to fixate them. Uh, the first uh, technique that we're gonna see is the iris suture IOL. Um, it was first described by McCannell very, uh, you know, many, many years ago. Uh, this, the, the one that I, the, the technique that I'm gonna show you is a modified uh, McCannell. Uh, in the McCannell technique, basically what you did was uh, put the uh, IOL, um, uh, you, you uh, hold it, uh, not in its longitudinal um, uh, axis, but it's on, in its horizontal axis. So we have the haptics basically cross one another. Uh, then the lens is inserted with a burato forceps. Uh, we use a, a cyclodialysis spatula to make sure that the lens doesn't uh, go to the vitreous cavity. Uh, and once we do that, we let it open uh, and the lens is fixated uh, uh, or captured in the AC by the pupil. And then we can see that the uh, haptics basically uh, are, uh, we can see them basically through, through the iris. And then we'll just pass a suture, a proline suture underneath the haptics, capturing the haptics with the iris. And McCannell, what he used to do was make an incision in the sclera to exteriorize the, uh, the, the, the suture and then a tie. But we can do a modified steps or not uh, to do this, this uh, same technique in the anterior chamber. And this is a, uh, um, the technique. Uh, again, this video was taken in the Flying Eye Hospital in a program I did with Orbis in Panama in which uh, the surgeons wanted to, to, to see intra intraocular fixation of lenses. So here the lens is already inside, it's fixated. We can see the, uh, the, the uh, haptics again, um, uh, you know, underneath the iris. And then we, push, we pass a uh, proline uh, 10 o suture that has a straight needle. It's again, this is a, a very easy needle to manipulate. It's a very thin needle. So the, uh, the, the advantage is that um, again, the, the hole that it makes on the iris is, is very small. Then we exteriorize uh, the suture with uh, a hook, and then we can do a, a uh, again, a suture. Back in these days, I wasn't acquainted with the uh, with the uh, sips or not, so I used to suture it inside of the um, uh, of the eye uh, and doing you know uh, three knots and then uh, cutting them. But as you can see, and as I showed you in, in in the pupillary reconstruction, basically we can just pass the suture, exteriorize it, and 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 leave again uh, the, uh, the the trailing. Uh, the trailing uh, suture and just do, doing four passes uh, and tying the knot. With four passes, the knot will sit in place and it'll be easy. Then once both uh, haptics are sutured, we just uh, basically move the optic uh, to the retropupillary plane and the lens is fixated in place. Obviously the question that we always have with these cases is if the proline will be reabsorbed. As you know, the reabsorption of proline is very, very low over time, but it happens. Uh, the advantage is that some fibrosis generate underneath the haptic, so they tend to sit in place. It's a good option as a primary procedure if we have a patient that, again, we weren't able to uh, place the lens, and uh, I think it's a much better option then implanting an angle-supported IOL, we just, again, go ahead and um, 
fixate the future, the, the IOL to the iris with a proline suture. The other option is uh, to suture the IOL to the sclera. And this is what was known as the Lewis technique. And basically what we do is again, use a proline suture. Uh, we create uh, two uh, opposing scleral flaps of 50% of the scleral thickness. Generally, they are triangular flaps. We'll see it in the video. And what we do is we, uh, at two millimeters from the limbus, we pass our straight uh, 10-0 proline suture, uh, and we pass a 27-gauge um, insulin needle, uh, again, two millimeters, two millimeters from the limbus uh, underneath our scleral flap. And then we basically um, pass the needles into the uh, insulin needle and exteriorize both um, uh, sutures. And then we go with a hook and bring, again, the suture through the wound, depending on the size of the lens that we're implanting nowadays. We do uh, acrylic lenses, but if we're going to do, for example, a PMMA um, a lens or a, a ZZ lens, a CZ lens uh, that has, uh, again, the, um, the holes for, for passing the suture, then we have to do a larger wound. Or if, we, if, or we, if we're going to implant an optic uh, iris um, lens that has, again, a, an iris prosthesis, uh, then we'll, we'll do a larger wound. But if we're going to do a um, an MA60 lens or a Technis once lens, a three millimeter incision should be enough. We exteriorize our suture, we cut it in half, we fixate the haptics we introduce, then we pull our, our, our sutures and then suture it to the sclera. So this is this technique. Um, this is a case, again, that had a, a corneal a transplant. Uh, in this case, as you can barely see, uh, there's a remnant of the capsule, um, uh, uh, inferior and temporal. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fixate the IOL or the haptic in the area where there's no capsular support. I'm going to place the lens, one haptic in the sulcus, and I'm gonna fixate the other haptic uh, again to uh, the sclera. But I thought it was a, it was a nice uh, video to show. So here I do a scleral flap, a triangular scleral flap, that's 50% uh, of thickness. Uh, the base of the scleral flap, flap is around two millimeters. Then I go in at two millimeters from the limbus uh, uh, into the, a posterior chamber, and I put an insulin an insulin needle, and I basically uh, pass the needle uh, into my insulin needle, my proline needle into my insulin needle, then exteriorize it. Uh, here it comes out. And uh, again, if we're going to fixate both haptics, basically what we do is pass that insulin needle through the, uh, underneath the uh, opposing sterile flap. Then um, I'm going to uh, do my um, wound incision because this is a transplant. I prefer to do it um, uh, in the limbus. Uh, again, I exteriorize it. I, I suture the um, uh, the haptic or I, 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 yeah, I tie the, the suture to the uh, trailing haptic. Uh, then I'm going to introduce the lens. It's folded with a burrato forceps. Uh, and here we can see that uh, the, the suture is fixated in exactly in the middle of, uh, of, of my haptic. Then I'm gonna basically put the lens in the posterior chamber. We can see now much better the remnant of, of my haptic. Uh, then I'm going to rotate the lens uh, clockwise. Uh, and as I rotate it, uh, then I'm gonna put the trailing haptic uh, in or over or in the sulcus over my capsule remnant. Uh, here I'm going to basically move it and I can put the uh, haptic again uh, over the capsule. And then basically I'll rotate the lens, uh, pull very gently my suture and the lens, as you can see, will rotate and end up where it's supposed to be. When we're doing this technique, 
again in and 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 fixating in 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 opposing sides it's very important that we know where the future is uh i think the the most difficult um um part of this technique is having all these futures you know tangling around we need to make sure which one is the trailing haptic and the leading uh uh, haptic so so we won't have uh, again the future behind the lens and everything entangled inside the eye once we uh, know that the lens is in place we'll just pass the suture uh, in the sclera underneath the flap and then um, pass it uh, leave a loop and uh, suture it and fixate it. it is very important that we do a flap and the reason is Proline, um, the, 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 the proline uh, tends to stick out. And if there's no scleral flap, it'll basically start eroding uh, the, uh, the, the conjunctiva. And then the patient is prone to having endophthalmitis. And, um, and, um, and again, it becomes very uncomfortable for the patient uh, for in body sensation. And again, as I said, the risk of having endophthalmitis is higher. It's important that, that we also cut the uh, the proline, uh, you know, uh, uh, very close to the to the knot, and we cover this knot with uh, our scleral flap. Uh, the flap is easy to 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 close. Just one ten o nylon suture should be uh, enough. And here we're finished, and we close the conjunctiva. We aspirate, and we see that our lens is sit, sitting very well in place. This is an old uh, video of 2015, but if I did it today, I would probably suture the, uh, the pupil to make it aesthetically better. Then there's the glued IOL technique, which is also a, a sterile fixation technique. Uh, this is nowadays my preferred technique for secondary IOLs. Uh, again, if you've done sutured uh, IOLs uh, to the sclera, basically modifying your technique. It's very simple. So that transition between suturing the IOL to fixating the IOL uh, through a sterile tunnel, it's, uh, it's quite simple. What um, you do is create two square uh, three by three uh, millimeter uh, scleral flaps of 50% of thickness, uh, opposing one another, we make a uh, uh, three millimeter, 3.2 millimeter incision. We're gonna use, if you use the uh, MA60 lens, basically we're gonna use the B cartridge so we can be inserted through a cartridge. We ins in start inserting the lens. We use the serrata forceps uh, that uh, to hold the lens and we introduce them through the, uh, a, a sclerotomy that's done two millimeters behind the limbus with a V lance uh, a sclerotome. Then we introduce our serrata forceps. We hold the tip of the leading haptic. Uh, we introduce the lens and we exteriorize the haptic through that uh, sclerotomy. And then it's called the handshake technique because basically we'll um, uh, hand the uh, trailing haptic to a uh, serrata forceps in the anterior chamber. Then we go through the sclerotomy, two millimeters behind of the limbus, uh, and we basically hand it to the other forceps and exteriorize both haptics. Uh, once they're exteriorized, we basically introduce them in a tunnel that we've previously, previously done with a 27 gauge needle. And then we glue the um, uh, scleral flaps uh, and the case is finished. So this is the glued uh, IOL technique introduced by um, Agarwal um, a few years back. And as I said, it's my preferred technique. So first, it's very important that we mark uh, the cornea in the center. Uh, that way we can uh, create our flaps um, and make them exactly 180 degrees apart. One of the uh, reasons why this procedure is so successful and there's no tilt in the lens is because is, is if we do our markings and we place the haptics exactly where they're supposed to be uh, opposing uh, 180 degrees one another. So here we create a flap 
we can use a 15 degree blade, we can use a diamond blade, we can use a crescent blade. Um, we do again three by three as if we were gonna do a trabeculectomy, a flap, then we go at 50% and we basically dissect it until we go to the limbus. We measure two millimeters with a caliper behind of the limbus that this is very important that we do the marking and we do a little mark on the edge of that um, of the sclera of, of that of that you know squared edge flap and we introduce a bent 27 uh, degree uh, uh, 27 gauge insulin needle we bend it 90 degrees we create that little tunnel and then we do again two opposing uh, paracentesis for us to manipulate inside the eye uh, we can do an inferior one if we're going to use an anterior uh, chamber maintainer. This we should use if there is has been a vitrectomy. If there's no vitrectomy, I believe if there's no need to use the anterior chamber, then we use the V lens to do a, a sclerotomy. Very important that we introduce our forceps and make sure that our forceps go in quite easily. There's nothing worse than having the lens inside. And again, our forceps uh, uh, are having difficulty introducing our forceps. We use the B cartridge. Then we basically, ex uh, again, exteriorize uh, the, the, the leading haptic. It's very important that we don't pull on the haptic. We just hold it until the lens goes in. And once the lens goes in the eye, then we can exteriorize it. Then we introduce the, the trailing haptic and hand it as a handshake technique. Uh, one to the other, uh, we hold it on the tip and we exteriorize this. It is important to hold it on the tip, that way we don't bend the haptic and it comes out easily through that um, sclerotomy. Then once we, this is the importance of marking, we introduce the haptic in that uh, tunnel that we've created in both sides. And as you can see, by introducing it, the lens basically seats very well with no tilt, and then we'll go on and use um, a tissue, a glue to fixate the, the flap and to, and to fixate the conjunctiva. Uh, here you can see how well the lens centers, and by doing all these measurements and introducing the haptic through the tunnel, basically the, slit, the lens will, will sit very well in place without uh, any tilt. The uh, formulas that I that I use um, in doing this are the formulas that I generally use, the Barrett uh, Universal 2 formula um, is the one that basically sits very well in all eyes, the same, the SRKT formula, and the predictability of the lens is very high if we place it exactly two millimeters behind the limbus. Um, this is uh, another, a video showing the same technique. Here uh, we have a an iris, uh, uh, sorry, a lens coloboma. Uh, again, it's the same technique. Uh, this video is a slightly accelerated um, again in, in time, but we do basically the same. And this technique I do uh, also in um, patients with uh, subluxated lenses. Uh, here I, you know, in hindsight. I could have done, uh, in this case, a uh, put a capsular tension ring. And back then I thought, you know, if I fixate uh, the lens to the sclera, um, it'll be stalled forever and ever. Uh, and that's the reason I, I didn't put a capsular tension ring and, and IOL in the bag, but it could also be a very good option. As you saw in the first case, when we do the aspiration of the lens, is the a 50 year old lady, her vision was very poor. Her best corrective vision was like um, uh, 2070. And uh, she actually ended up very, very good with a 2020 vision. There was no reason for her not to see uh, uh, very well. Then we aspirate the lens. Again, the aspiration is, is very simple. We stabilize the lens with the iris hooks, uh, put a little bit of viscoelastic. And then once we finished, uh, we'll put some viscous aspic in the AC. We'll go in and do our sclerotomy two millimeters behind the limbus. Very important. Again, by having the capsule um, uh, in the eye, there's no vitreous coming uh, to the AC, and we minimize 
complications like retinal detachment, we go in, uh, increase our wound to 3.2 millimeters, test that our sclerotomies are big enough for our forceps to go in and, uh, and to, to the lens. Uh, these opposing scleral flaps, my experience is that we should do always uh, uh, supranasally, slightly supranasally and slightly supratemporal. It allows for a better manipulation uh, inside of the eye. If we do them nasal and temporal uh, at nine and three o'clock, uh, sometimes it, the nose, it, it makes it difficult to manipulate these uh, forceps. Uh, and, uh, and, and so by doing it slightly supranasal and slightly supra, uh, uh, inferotemporal, it is easier to manip manipulate within the eye. Uh, here we go in and do the handshake technique, take the tip of our haptic, uh, exteriorize it. And then uh, once the lens is very well centered, we fixate it. Uh, uh, we introduce the haptic on our previously braided tunnels. As you can see, the lens sits very, very well in place. It's very well centered. Uh, if we want to center it uh, even more, we can just introduce the haptic. Um, and this, I'm going to pause it because this is a modification of the glued IOL technique. I found that in patients, if you don't have access to glue, uh, to tissue glue or because of the cost, because it is a high cost, we can basically go in and suture the sclerotomy with a, uh, it's it's called an X suture. We basically make two passes. Uh, we, we close the suture uh, uh, and then we go again, we pass it again underneath the haptic and suture it. It'll make an X suture as you'll see, uh, having a twofold purpose. One is closing the sclerotomy and the other one is holding the haptic in place. That minimizes the risk of a subluxation. And then we close our flap, close our uh, conjunctiva. And as you can see, the, the lens centers very well. We aspirate the viscoelastic with a very good outcome. Then there are tougher cases in which uh, uh, this is a patient that came to me. Uh, she had a, a subluxated um, lens. They did her cataract. They put a, 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 a capsular tension ring and uh, then and an IOL in the back. And the patient comes again with a subluxated uh, IOL capsular tension ring and back. That's the reason why when I have these subluxated lenses, I'd rather uh, do a fix uh, uh, a scler fix fixated IOL instead of, of, of putting a capsule protection in because this happens uh, from time to time. And uh, so here what we do is again, the same uh, procedure. Uh, we do our markings, uh, the pupils dilated. As you can see, there's, sorry, there's phimosis of, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the anterior capsule, uh, the lens is highly subluxated. So we do, again, our same technique. Our planning is the same. We do our scleral flaps. Um, if you do trapeculectomies, this part of the procedure is very simple to do. I, I always tell my glaucoma associate that I used to do her cataracts and she used to do the trapeculectomies. And uh, that for me, it was like a fellow because I, I learned to do them how she did it. And again, it's, it's, it, it's quite the same. So it has helped me to do my uh, squared edge scleral flaps. Uh, again, uh, what's sometimes difficult is to estimate the, the depth. Uh, then we mark two millimeters behind the limbus. We use our bent uh, insulin needle. Uh, it's important that we don't hold against the flap when we're when we're uh, introducing the needle. As you can see, I'm holding uh, the conjunctiva because we don't want to rip the flap. Um, the other thing that I do is is mark, put some trip and glue in in that needle so I can make sure where the flap is. Then I do my paracentesis. I go in with my V-lens and uh, create a, a sclerotomy. Uh, Generally, if you uh, increase the size of the sclerotomy a little bit, it'll be easier to explant the haptics. If you do it very small, you know, the haptic might be get, the tip of the haptic might get entangled and then uh, it'll, be, it'll be hard. So here I, bake, I, I need to explant this lens. So I'm, 
I'm uh, like cutting the phimosis. But here, what I see is as I go in that the posterior capsule is, is broken. As you could see, I, I introduced some um, viscoelastic and you can see that the lens basically uh, moves uh, or tilts slightly backwards. So I decide that I'm gonna grab it with my forceps. Uh, it's a one piece IOL. So I'm gonna bring it uh, to the anterior chamber. Here you can see I'm using, I'm using the, uh, the, the cyclodialysis spatula, bring it to the anterior chamber. Uh, and once my lens is in the anterior chamber, I can go ahead and explant it. I increase the, the size of the wound, two, three millimeters. Then I'll go in, hold the haptic, use the Vanna scissor to cut the lens in the radius. You don't have to cut it, cut it completely and basically rotate it and explant it. Then we'll go ahead and put some viscoelastic, grasp that capsular tension ring and, and, and explant it. So now we've removed that lens. And because we have a sclerotomy that's two millimeter, two millimeters behind the limbus, then we can go ahead and do an anterior vitrectomy uh, through the pars plana. Uh, again, removing that uh, capsule and whatever vitreous is there. This is very important that we can use uh, to doing a pars plana vitrectomy and anterior vitrectomy. Again, we want to make sure that there's no vitreous uh, strands or bands uh, in the AC, and then we go in and, and implant our lens. This lens I like a lot, and it's a very good option. It's a focus mat, mat matrix uh, IOL. It has PVDA haptics, which are better than the MA6 haptics, and it, they have a C configuration. So it, they're easier to, uh, ex to exteriorize the risk of of rupturing the haptic uh, is very low. And um, again, very easy to grab, very easy to manipulate. And because they don't have a, the, the, the haptic doesn't have a J shape, but a C shape, they're easier to introduce in our uh, 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 scleral tunnels. Uh, as you can see, very easy to, to introduce. And uh, then the lens is sitting very well. And then we do, our suturing technique, we go underneath the uh, lens and then we do a second pass to close the sclerotomy and that will hold, hold our lens in place. And then we can go ahead, close our sclerotomy, close the conjunctiva. And always when we finish and when we do the, uh, the aspiration of the viscoelastic, we'll see how the lens sits in place and uh, it's, it's, it's fixated where it's supposed to be uh, uh, and, and it doesn't move either backward. Uh, again, this is the test that our lens is very well fixated. Um, I like sometimes to put a little bit of air in the HC and that is the end of the case. This is the post-op. Uh, again, as you can see, we see our sutures closing the sclerotomy. The lens is sitting very well in place. The PVDA uh, haptics uh, and the lens is very well centered. This is a, a picture of uh, ritual elimination uh, showing that the lens is sitting very well in place. Uh, more complex cases like the one I showed you initially in which we're, we're gonna do a combined uh, procedure before doing an endothelial keratoplasty. Then again, we're gonna remove that bike of, bike of IOL, fixate our MA60 uh, to the sclera. And uh, again, once you have mastered your secondary IOL technique, uh, it's very easy to tangle these very complex cases because basically I like to tell um, in my lectures that you see them with different eyes. So these eyes look very, very bad, uh, but then you look at them and you see, well, I can, I, I, I can probably fix this eye if I first, if, if, if the visual prognosis is, is quite good, then I'll be able to remove that AC IOL, then I'm gonna fix it. A, a, a posterior chamber uh, IOL. And then once I do that, I'll be able to do uh, an endothelial keratoplasty. In, in these complex cases, I prefer to do DSEC as opposed to DMIC. We're gonna see it um, uh, in, in, in one of the next cases. Uh, so we create our flap. I'm gonna, again, this is, uh, it repeats itself. Where we create our flap of, uh, uh, 
sometimes they bleed a lot because uh, because again these they're very in swollen eyes with a lot of inflammation and pannus and vascularization. So <clears throat> we open our wound, we go ahead, we untangle that uh, bike of IOL, we remove the haptic. It's very important that we make sure that it's it's not uh, again, there's no sinicia of the lens uh, against the iris because then we can uh, produce an irad iridodialysis and that'll lead to again having to fixate that. Then it's very important in this case that we have a poor visualization to remove that fibrotic uh, epithelium uh, with the panis uh, that it has. Uh, that will give us better visualization of the anterior chamber. These eyes do not dilate very well, so it's important that we use everything that we have in our arsenal, like our iris hooks. Uh, that way we make sure that we have uh, better visualization of what we're going to do uh, by reconstructing these anterior segments. Uh, once we open our pupil, uh, we have better visualization. We create our little uh, tunnels. We measure, again, always measure, measure, measure. We don't want, uh, again, if we do all these measurements, we make sure that the sense will sit perfectly in place and uh, it won't have uh, decentration or tilt. We go in with our VLANs create our sclerotomy. Very important that we see the tip of our, 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 of our uh, VLANs. That way we make sure that we're where we were supposed to be. Then we go ahead, uh, handle uh, again our uh, haptic, leading haptic. Uh, as you can see, I don't pull on it until the lens comes into the eye. That way we won't, uh, um, again, remove the haptic from its insertion on the optic. And then we, because this is a larger wound, I don't do, need to do a handshake. I just can, uh, again, bring it in and exteriorize it and then go ahead and tuck that haptic into my tunnel. Sometimes it's difficult if it's bleeding. Uh, but again, we can, we can perfectly do it. And then again, I, I hate to repeat myself, but if you do your measurements and you, you know, uh, tuck it where it's supposed to be, we can see that the lens sits perfectly in place. In this case, I again, I didn't use tissue glue. I just passed my uh, X-shaped uh, suture and removed my hooks, close the wound, close the flaps, then close our main incision and aspirate the viscoelastic. And we can see that the lens sits perfectly in place. Want to make sure that there are no sinicae and the case is finished. This is the post-op. Uh, just after the explantation and the IOL fixation, we can see our haptics uh, that transilluminate through the sclera. And then this is after a DSEC. Uh, uh, in this same case, here we see the suture of the DSEC. The night cornea is nice and clear, and we've uh, basically solved uh, such a difficult um, uh, case. And uh, this sometimes I I do them uh, uh, combined. We do everything. This is a patient that uh, I had done done back in 2012. Um, I he was aphakic. I implanted an artisan uh, aphakia lens uh, in the AC. Um, he came back. I think it was uh, uh, two years back or or last year uh, with a uh, de uh, decompensated uh, cornea. So I told him, okay, let's let's go ahead, let's remove that lens. I can't be sure that the cause was uh, the the, the fake lens. Again, these patients that had had vitrectomy have lower cell counts, uh, but I decided that the best option was to basically, uh, if I'm going to do the endothelial keratoplasty. I'll, I'll better remove that uh, lens. This is a modification of the technique that I'm using, doing right now. Here I'm using a 1.2 millimeter um, uh, uh, knife to create a little pocket, and then I'll go with a needle. Uh, that way, I create like a yeah, like a little pocket, and then the, and then I make the tunnel. So when I'm when I'm looking or trying to find that that tunnel, it's it's easier. 
Uh, and I put some viscoelastic in the AC and underneath the, um, the uh, artisan lens. I'll open it. I'll uh, remove the enclavation of the iris. Very simple procedure to do. Just go ahead and with the needle um, do an, an inverted procedure instead of tucking it uh, from posterior to anterior. We do it from anterior to posterior, then use an inverted Stinsky hook to remove the um, artisan aphakia lens. Then I'll go in and place. Uh, because it's a large wound, I don't have to bend the lens or use the uh, the uh, the injector. Then I place it in the AC over the uh, iris. Then I go in with my serrata forceps and I do the handshake technique. Again, uh, hand it the, the tip, then exteriorize the leading haptic, then introduce the trailing haptic, and again, hand it to the other forceps, then tray the uh, exteriorize the haptics, tuck it in, and that gives a, a good centration. As you can see, the lens slightly decenter, but as I as I tuck it in, uh, it'll it'll center perfectly. Uh, once I tuck it in, I do my X uh, suture uh, again, suturing the uh, the sclerotomy, and then going underneath the haptic. Here we go. I go underneath the haptic, uh, again, a second pass, and that makes the X suture suture it. So it closes the sclerotomy and it holds the lens in place. Then I close my sclerotomy flap. And then I go ahead because I have this scholastic, I'll do my desmatorexis to uh, uh, remove the, uh, the uh, endothelium that is uh, non-functional. Uh, remove it. The reason I prefer doing a DSEC in these cases and not a DMEC is that I find that there's no advantage of doing a DMEC. Generally, these patients have a very limited, limited visual acuity prognosis. So again, if you're going to have a, a, a 2040 or a 2030 instead of a 2020, well, there's basically no reason to do a DSEC. The advantage of doing a DMEC is this: a DSEC is that these patients are vitrectomized and uh, generally fitting the or fixating uh, the uh, endothelial transplant is easier. Then we can centrate uh, a transplant, put some air in the AC and the case is finished. And lastly, I'm gonna show uh, a, a technique that I don't do very often. And the reason I don't do it very often is because I've tried it four or five times and I find that it is difficult than what it seems to be. Um, and it is the lens ten, tends to have tilt and it's not as well centered as I, as I achieve with my agar wall technique. And this is, this is, I'm gonna lower the volume a little bit. This is, it was given to me, it was uh, shared to me by our great friend, Gerardo Vendecchia, who does it uh, frequently. Um, and uh, this is uh, the Yamane technique. So again, a lot of people like it. A lot of people feel comfortable with it. Um, again, if you feel comfortable with it, go ahead and do it. Um, my experience, my personal experience, is that it is uh, tougher than it seems to be, and um, it, it and the lens tends to have a greater tilt than with the uh, agar wall technique. Uh, in this technique, basically, what we'll do is instead of creating uh, the scleral flap, we'll basically uh, exteriorize the ha exteriorize the haptics. And then um, uh, basically with a cautery, uh, burn the tip of the haptic. So it uh, creates a little bulb and uh, prevent it from look, uh, luxating inside of the eye. The advantage is that by not doing, uh, again, a sterile flap, it's, it's uh, faster than the agar wall of uh, sterile fixation technique. Um, what Gerardo did, and this is his modified technique, is that instead of just going in with the needle, he creates he creates a little pocket um, uh, with the with a, a, a paracentesis 1.2 millimeter knife. He creates a little pocket. Uh, so here he's now he's removed the the, the lens, and uh, he'll go ahead and remove uh, the capsule. And as you'll see, he creates a little pocket in which then he introduces the needle through the pocket and, uh, and, and, and he does it. Here he's removing the capsule. This again, as you can see, there's 
traction on the sawmill, traction if you have all these ports, well, you might as well in, go in and do an anterior vitrectomy and remove it uh, again with the vitrector. I think it's, it's, it's much, much better uh, creating less uh, pulling of the uh, features uh, with less risk. So he uses a, uh, a diamond knife. He presets it to 400 um, microns. And then he'll do a, as you can see, he'll do a, 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 a small incision. And then he'll use the VLANs to create a little pocket. And this is quite good because the bulb of the haptic will be uh, underneath. And then he'll go and introduce his, uh, his bent uh, 30 gauge needle uh, you can use, you know, or 27 gauge needle. Make sure that, uh, again, the, you, you can introduce the haptic on the needle. He introduces both needles, as you can see. This is the other thing that I don't like about this technique. You don't know what this needle is doing inside of the eye, but then you introduce the lens with uh, the uh, injector and, you know, introducing this haptic on the needle is quite easy. It's probably the simplest part of the procedure. And then once you introduce it, you leave that needle inside the eye and you introduce the trailing haptic. Using an MA60 lens to do this is very difficult. It's much better to use the Technis one lens, which is this one that has a, it doesn't, it, you know, the, the loop of the haptic is not as uh, angled. So it's easier to uh, exteriorize the trailing haptic uh, or the um, focus matrix IOL. Uh, then once you exteriorize the haptic, you use the cautery to create this little bulb. Here we exteriorize the, the haptic again and create this uh, little bulb. And uh, again, that uh, the problem here is, you know, to measure it, make sure that uh, it is where it's supposed to be. This is the problem that I have with this technique. As you can see, we can see the edge of the lens here uh, in the pupil. So the centration and the tilt are my concerns with this technique. But it is, I think, if you if you master it and and you use it and you feel comfortable with it, it is a very good technique. Uh, and here he want, he shows again how the bulb is tucked in uh, within that pocket that he created uh, again. Uh, so this is a very good thing. So the take home messages is that there are very, various options for secondary IOL implantation. Know them, get acquainted and master one of one or two of these techniques and use them. Once you again, master and feel comfortable with them, you can tackle most of the cases that come to you uh, and you can either solve them and as a primary procedure, if you have a complicated cataract surgery, you can go ahead, create your flaps or, or do the Yamana technique and fixate the lens. Or if they come to you after a complicated cataract, they can, then you can go ahead and uh, fixate the secondary IOLs. I didn't talk about the flan techniques. Um, again, you can look for them in the internet. I don't use them, but they're an option. Uh, again, their option with one piece IOLs. Basically, what you do is you create with a with a proline five O suture uh, in the optic of the lens. You you you, you place four sutures um, and and you introduce the the five O proline. You exteriorize the five O proline and then you create a little bulb, just as the Yamani technique, and that holds the lens in place. But again, these are lenses that we have available for us, the MA60, the Technis One, the Focus Matrix Lens. So with these, we can solve uh, most of the problems that we have. Let's see if I can answer some of the um, questions. Uh, um, we'll do it briefly. Any tips to constrict the pupil before implanting ICOL or iris fixated IOL? Um, uh, yes, uh, use uh, my, you can use myocol. Uh, acetylcholine uh, in the AC uh, that will reduce the size of the pupil. But again, nowadays I've shifted, and as you probably saw, uh, and I, I didn't show this, but up to 2013, I believe, my preferred um, uh, technique uh, between 2003 and 2006 or seven, my preferred technique was to suture the IOL 
with tenoproline uh, in the posterior chamber. Then the artisan aphakic lenses came and my preferred technique was to use those. They were very easy to implant, very short procedure. Uh, I show you those uh, older videos, but as of 2013 and on, my preferred technique is to fixate them to the uh, posterior um, chamber using the, the, using the agar wall technique. In my view, in my view, again, it, it, there's no sense of using angle fixated IOLs. The complications that we see over time are high. And um, uh, again, if you want to use an AC IOL, use uh, an artisan aphakia lens. And again, constrict the pupil with uh, myocol or acetylcholine. So this one was answered. Can you share your experience with scleral fixated IOL, pros and cons, and a special device? Thank you. I think we've gone over that. Um, my preferred technique is the uh, is the agar wall technique. I think is is it, it it gives a good centration, no tilt, and uh, a little bit more difficult and cumbersome to do. Uh, but I think we've gone over that uh, uh, you know extensively. Do you prefer to use cryoprobe or lens to loop or lens loop uh, to do the I used to use, I do it seldomly. Again, the cryoprobe, I think it's the best option. Um, but the loop, what happens with the loop and the loop works very well if the lens is luxated uh, in inferiorly. I mean, if the zonule that is holding the lens is in the inferior end of the eye at, at six o'clock, then you can go in with the loop and bring it up. But if the lens like this one, the, the loop is, is fixated at 12 o'clock going underneath the lens is very difficult. What you do is basically drop the lens to the vitreous, cap, uh, uh, to the vitreous cavity. So yes, you can use the, lo the, the loop if the if the if there's if the if the zonular descent is at twelve o'clock or in the superior portion, then the loop is a good option. How to end the knot at sterile fixation? Again, you pass the suture not completely. You leave a loop. And then you you, you suture it to that loop, uh, and 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 that is the way uh, to uh, to tie the knot. You basically cut it, and uh, I think that answers the question. Do you recommend gluteal technique for PMA IOLs? Um, yes, yes, but it has to be uh, again a three-piece PMA IOL. It works exactly the same because the haptics are the same. Um, and, uh, and and you can do it, you don't need an acrylic IOL. The only thing that you have to take into consideration is that it is a six millimeter IOL. So you should uh, uh, make your wound or your main incision uh, 6.5 millimeter, but it works exactly the same. And the technique is basically the same. I glued, I, I've used that technique for, as I said, the optic um, iris prosthesis IOL, which is a big IOL, nine millimeters, that has an iris or a color for free mimicking the iris. And, and I've used that technique um, that has some loops. So you cannot exteriorize the loops. You have to just basically uh, suture. How to tie the spiral sutures in the Lewis technique. Okay, I think I've gone over it. You, uh, you because you exteriorize it and you have a, a needle over here, a curved needle, you go into the sclera and you pass it. So you have a loop and the loop that you cut uh, where the, the on the uh, suture, on the needle end of the suture. And then you basically tie it, tie it with the loop and, and make four passes. And then you cut those knots. So that very, they're, you know, they're um, very close to the knot and they don't uh, stick out and, and, and sterilize. In I cryoprobe use uh, for ICA, how serious is the risk of until touch damage? Uh, again, it is, but if you use that, uh, that fixating suture on the cornea, it'll be, um, it'll be uh, basically uh, easy to, to do. Um, the, 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 the lecture wasn't about ice, uh, intracapsular extraction, Again, I just wanted to show it how to fixate the lens in these cases. How do you do pars plana core vitrectomy? Would you do a pars plana core vitrectomy or anterior vitrectomy in a non vitrectomized eye before doing the glio? Yes, yes, it's always important to do. Uh, 
Again, I didn't show it. I had a case in, in which the lens is highly subluxated. I bring it up, I, I fixate it, I remove the cataract, and I do anterior vectrectomy, core vectrectomy. It's important that as anterior segment surgeons, we know how to do a, an anterior vectrectomy. Again, that way there'll be no features, strands, or bands uh, against uh, the IOL or, or we're not pulling in, and that reduces the risk of, um, of retinal detachment. Could you repeat the name of the lens you prefer for the technique? Again, it's the, it's the, and I'm going to write it down because it's the focus. It, there are two lenses that are very good for this. Uh, the uh, Technis one three-piece IOL or the uh, 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 focus matrix three-piece IOL. The focus matrix piece three-piece IOL is a lens, it's an acrylic uh, hydrophobic IOL made in India, and it has PVD F uh, haptics. Please, that's so, yeah, so that's the lens. How do you change the power of IOLs for AC and sclerophyx hypertrophy? Oh, okay, very, very, very good question. Um, when you use an AC IOL, um, for example, the artisan aphekic IOL, the IOL constant is uh, normally, if we're going to fix it in the AC, it's 116.0. If we're, we're going to invert that lens and put it in the posterior, or we're going to fix it to an iris, but posteriorly, then the, um, the, the constant is 117.0. If we're gonna fixate a lens to the sclera, an MA60, a Technis 1, or an in-focus, then the um, uh, constant is the same as that, we'll, as that, that we would use for a sulcus uh, IOL, 118.9 in an, in, in an uh, MA60, 119 for a Technis 1, and 118.0 for the focus matrix IOL. Uh, so that's how you, so basically you change the power based on the, how you change the IRL constant. Uh, what is your preferred way of anesthesia and secondary implantation? Great question. Uh, it has to be subtenance or general, uh, uh, or retrobulbar or peribulbar. Uh, uh, many years ago, I abandoned peribulbar and retrobulbar. I only do subtenance or general. Uh, the advantage of subtenance is that you get a very good anesthesia of the eye. The disadvantage is that there's still eye movement and you want, again, this is a, a procedure that takes 45 minutes to perform. So you want the eye to, to stay still. Do you prefer retropupillary design IOL over anterior pupillary one? I prefer the anterior uh, artisan, if I get a lens over retropupillar. I've done retropupillar, but it is not as easy as it seems. What I would recommend is that when you're going to do it, so you have the lens, you pass a, a silk suture through the haptics. Uh, that way, if the lens, you know, luxates, uh, you can bring it back uh, up front. Uh, and then you go in and you tuck it with your forceps underneath the iris and you go with either a Sinsky hook and you try to find where that um, uh, iris claw is and then you press down. The reason I prefer the anterior uh, chamber artisan effective lenses is because these lenses, if, they, if a patient has a blade to his head, they can luxate. And if they luxate in the anterior chamber, it's very easy to, uh, to repair. Whereas if it luxates to the posterior chamber, it starts tangling, and then you have to do a sclerotomy to push it back forward. So that's why I prefer the an, uh, anterior to a pupil over the posterior. Is it safe to dilate eyes that have artisan lens? Yeah, it's perfectly safe. There's really no, no trouble whatsoever. As you saw in the video, I dilated that lens that I, because I need to fixate the lens. So it's dilated and it, it really has no problems. How to tie the stereo sutures in the Lewis technique? I've, we've covered that already. Which one of these techniques do you recommend for research for, for research for setting? We can get all the instruments. I would say either the uh, Agarwal uh, modified, my modified technique in which I suture it, um, uh, that would be the best option. Uh, if not, 
the Yamane technique, I think if, if, if you're able to, to use it and, 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 and again, get accustomed to fixating the following, the, 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 not the leading haptic, but the following haptic, again, that is a very good technique, requires very little instruments, just an anterior, uh, a forceps, a uh, uh, retina forceps and, uh, and a needle. Is it possible to do ACIOL with features in the anterior chamber in my to increase IOP? Uh, yeah, you can do it, but you have to do an anterior detractor. Again, you cannot put an IOL with AC with vitreous in the anterior chamber. You have to uh, remove that vitreous. Again, when you're manipulating inside the AC, then um, you're going to pull on the vitreous and that could lead to a retinal detachment. So always when you think of secondary IOL, try to fixate the anterior chamber. Initially, you want to clear that of vitreous, make sure that they're now synechiate. Uh, because then you'll you go in and you'll have a very difficult time and then you'll just feel frustrated and the outcome will be worse than what you had initially. I think I've answered all these questions. I think this cover covers our webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, again, I'll, we'll see you we'll see you in a future webinar with Orbis. Thanks a lot to. Andy Cheng and Lauren Sika for helping me today. And um, again, see you later.